My background is in physics, but I've been uh, working with uh, patent law and IP for just over 16 years now. Um, given my background, I tend to work with uh, engineering, uh, electrical, automotive technology, um, fairly wide range. I also advise on trademarks, copyright, and designs, and so on. Um, just briefly about Wilson Gunn, we were formed originally in Manchester in 1864, so we've been around for some time. Um, that's our head office, although we now have offices in Birmingham and London as well. Um, as patent and trademark attorneys go, uh, we are medium size. We have 22 attorneys, um, and we like to think that we're friendly but formidable. Um, inherently, our business is an international one, and we've been dealing with lots of countries all around the world for a long time. Uh, I asked our records people in how many countries we've got active cases, and they told me it was just over 220. That was before the Olympics, and I thought, I wonder if they made a mistake, because it sounds an awful lot to me, but once you've seen an Olympic opening ceremony, you can understand that there are that many countries. The school asked if I would talk on protecting IP in China, and China is an exciting market, it's increasingly important um, for a lot of businesses, and it's increasingly important for us. Um, but from an IP point of view, it is perhaps not quite as remarkable um, for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, I can tell you that the Chinese IP laws, which are relatively new, are modelled on the German laws. So uh, they are very similar to the laws in Germany and the rest of Europe and much of the rest of the world. There's a long history of international cooperation in IP uh, and so laws tend to be the same uh, in, uh, in most countries, broadly speaking. So bearing that in mind, I think it would be more useful to talk generally about IP and what can be protected, just have a run through the key rights um, to give you a feel for what sort of things can be protected uh, and then look about how you go uh, about protecting internationally and the sort of key decision points in that process. Um, and then we can say a few words specifically uh, about issues that uh, China raises. So intellectual property, what is it? Um, it's an umbrella term which we might say broadly speaking means the property of ideas. Um, it's a misconception sometimes that intellectual property is something in itself. Can I have an intellectual property for this? Um, well, no, you can't, but you can have one or more of a number of specific um, intellectual property rights. And these rights are granted on a national basis, with one or two exceptions, which I'll, I'll mention later on. So if you get a particular right for a particular country, that enables you to stop other people doing what that right says in that country and you need to apply it on a country by country basis to to get rights um, but as I say there's a long history of international cooperation so it's not quite as uh, difficult and complicated as it may sound. The key rights that you'll come across are patents, designs, trademarks and copyright and we'll have a look at those by way of an example of a motor car. It's quite possible to have more than one type of right protecting a particular article and of course a motor car is a whole bundle of technology and design and so on so uh, it can carry an awful lot of rights. Patents protect inventions, they protect how things, made, how things are made, how they work, um, usually and hopefully in a fairly broad way. Then we've got designs. Designs protect the visual appearance of something rather than the fundamentals of how it's made or how it works, and that can be internal or external appearance. Copyright uh, protects um, the expression of a largely a literary work, which might include a computer program, uh, or an artistic work. And trademarks sit slightly apart because they do a different job. Um, they distinguish the goods or services of one undertaking from those of another. Every business has a trademark, every business has a name. It could be a name, it could be a badge, or, or in fact it could be some other feature of a, a product or service. So let's have a look at some examples and, and start with patents. This is the front page of a, a patent application. It's a, a UK patent application, uh, which it says, uh, which we also know by the the country code GB, 
all patent documents have a country code uh, based on the standard. There's a two-letter code for each country. Uh, it has a publication number, and it's followed by the letter A, which means it's an application. If a patent's granted, you get a published document which has a B at the end of that number, and it will also say patent on, but uh, it's often a mistake that people are reading the wrong document. Uh, we've got the application here rather than the patent because the application uh, usually has the abstract and a picture on the front to have a look at, and the patent's not quite as interesting. So this is a patent application which is titled Internal Combustion Engine Turbocharger with Electric Motor Drive. And I suppose you'd expect if something's going to be patented on a motor car, it could well be technology in the engine. And what this is protecting is an engine which has got a, a turbocharger which is driven, it has an electric motor to drive the turbocharger. Uh, and there's also a system of valves and ducts which enable air from the compressor in the turbocharger to be blown into the exhaust system. And it does that shortly after the engine has started to put some extra oxygen into the exhaust uh, so that the exhaust catalysts uh, kick off and start working earlier in the cycle to reduce emissions. And there are other ways of doing this and the, the main other way of doing this is to have a, a pump attached to the engine that pumps air into the exhaust system. But this allows the turbocharged system to be used to do two jobs and save some weight. So this is protecting the structure of part of the engine and it's protecting how it works. It's a combination of what you've got and how it's been put together and how it's been arranged to work. And this is directed to an ignition key switch mechanism. Um, it's one that's intended to be used on a vehicle with an automatic transmission uh, and it's set up with the transmission so that there's an interlock between the transmission selector and the ignition key so that you can't take the ignition key out until the selector is put into the park position. And what this is actually protecting is the fairly detailed design of this ignition switch. Um, there's a system of solenoids there which operate locks on the uh, ignition switch which prevent you taking the key out and they're arranged in such a way that reduces the load of current on the vehicle's battery. Uh, so there's a, a technical advantage in that. But again, we're looking at protecting here a combination of the structure, what we've got, to, what, we've got what the kit is, how it's been put together, and how it's been arranged uh, to work. Here's, here's another example. Um, in the usual way that patent applications have, this has this sort of bleak title improvements in or relating to stitched perforated sheet materials. The problem that uh, we have here is you know, the must-have feature in your motor car is ventilated seats so that you can have warm or cool air blown through the seat. Now if you have leather upholstery that presents a problem and you have to perforate the leather in order to let the air through. And what uh, Bensley were doing in this case is they were wanting to make a quilted design on their upholstery. So they took perforated leather uh, and then they stitched onto it a diamond or square pattern uh, quilted design, which they'd been doing before. Um, but it looked a bit of a mess because what happens when you run perforated leather through a sewing machine trying to do a, a line of stitching which cuts across the perforations is that the sewing machine needle gets dragged into the holes that are already there and the stitching starts to zigzag and that doesn't look very attractive and customers wouldn't be particularly happy when they've forked out £100,000 or so for their motor car and uh, the, the stitching on the seats is a bit wonky. So the upholstery department had a, a bright idea which was well let's leave an unperforated line, let's leave a gap and then we'll stitch down that line. And as you stitch down that line, the line of stitching forms a set of its own perforations, which completes the pattern. So we start with a, a template uh, material, which has got perforated and unperforated regions. And then we just stitch down the unperforated region, and that completes the pattern. You can stitch a normal straight line of stitching, and it all looks very elegant. Uh, are much better than the stitch seats on the, the rival Mercedes-Benz. 
where they hide all their stitching because they can't get it to run in a straight line. So what does this patent protect? Um, this is an application that's actually been granted now. It protects a method of producing a stitched perforated material, and it sets out a series of steps. And uh, from the top of my head, the, the steps are that we provide material with perforated and unperforated regions, that we stitch in the unperforated region along a line which is parallel to the edge of the perforated region and spaced from it by an integer number of multiples of the spacing between the lines of perforations in the perforated region. So it would enable the proprietor Bentley to stop other people using that method. Uh, and as all patents for methods or processes uh, work, it also protects any product which has been made by that process. Because you'll see that, of course, with this product, the end product uh, may look, it should look better than that it looks very similar to uh, making it in the conventional way and stitching down a wholly perforated material. Um, if that was done very well, you might not be able to tell the difference, but this will protect the method of performing those steps and uh, anything which has been made by that method. So, moving on to designs. This is a community design registration. This is one of the exceptions in that it isn't a purely national right. Um, you can get a community design registration which covers all the countries of the European Union uh, in one registration and it's very good value. Um, a design registration basically consists of a series of images of the design. Uh, so this is the motor car. Um, we've got images from all sides except the underneath. We don't bother to show bits that don't really matter. Um, no one's going to buy the car on the strength of the design underneath. Or more to the point, people are less likely to copy the design underneath, so we don't want to be restricted to what we've done uh, on the underside. This registration um, then confers a monopoly in this design, in this visual appearance, whether it's the shape of a motor car or anything else made to the same shape. So it could be a toy car, it covers that, it could be a birthday cake made to this shape, it's still covered. And this registration uh, enables the owner to prevent third parties from making articles to that design or something which is similar, but basically fairly close. It's defined, defined in the law as any design which does not confer different overall impression on an informed user. It's another one of our uh, legal characters. In some countries, certainly in Europe and the UK, you can register the design of part of an article. And that's often a very useful way of getting uh, broader protection. And the view here is that it's very unlikely that another manufacturer is going to reproduce the whole design of a motor car. It's too risky and, and too expensive and uh, it, it doesn't happen. But what they're more likely to do is to take bits of the design, important cues, and um, if you're following motor car designs, um, you'll appreciate that Bentley are fairly upset with Chrysler uh, on the, for making the Chrysler 300, which looks from the front very much like a Bentley. So what we've also done is this is a separate registration, and it's just for the front view. And that's protected on its own. Um, the strength of this was actually shown recently because we were advising a client who uh, was going to import into the UK a, a steam mop uh, from a manufacturer in China. Uh, and it was there to compete with an existing product made by another manufacturer. And when you looked at it, you could see that they'd done a very good job of redesigning it just enough to get round the design protection on the original product. From the front, it looked quite different. From the side, it looked quite different. But from the back, it looked just the same. Um, they obviously got a bit bored in doing this redesign. When they got to the back, they just left it. Uh, and the 
the rights holder of the original design had been well advised and it had got a community design just for the back. So even though they redesigned three sides of it, we had to say no because you were going to infringe this registration for the back view only. So that's a worthwhile exercise, is registering the important bits of a design. This is a design registration for the stitched, perforated, quilted upholstery. So we can get a registered design for this to protect its appearance. We can also get a patent for the way that it's been made. And it's often the case that you can get more than one right for a single product. And this is quite a usual strategy because registered designs are obtained quickly, relatively cheaply, but the protection is narrow because it's protecting something that looks like that. Um, a patent is something which is more uncertain whether or not you're going to get it. It's going to take longer, it's going to cost more. So we put both applications in together. We've got the certainty of getting some registered design protection early on, and we may or may not be able to get a patent um, in, in due course, and in this case, we were able to do that. I said that no manufacturer would copy the entire shape of a motor car. <coughs> this is the, the Geely Gee, which was I think, probably the Shanghai Auto Show a few years back. And there's more than a passing resemblance to the Rolls Royce Phantom. So it does happen. Um, certainly for Bentley, probably for Rolls-Royce Motors, China is now the number one market. Uh, so when we're looking at China, we do more to protect in China now than any other market. Uh, because in China, we know that it's the one country that probably has the resources and, and the nerve to copy the whole thing. Uh, so we take much more care in China than we did, and probably more than we do anywhere else. A topical design point, Apple and Samsung, it's been in, in the news a lot. Um, the European UK uh, decisions that are being reported where uh, Samsung's was found not to infringe Apple's rights were actually relating to a community registered design, um, not to a uh, patent. And actually, the community registered design, this is the Samsung product, Apple's community registered design was for this design, which is not the same as the iPad. So the case, which is widely reported, isn't uh, relating to infringement of any rights for the iPad. It's in relation to uh, a different uh, design. Uh, and this is where, in the first instance in the UK, uh, the famous judgment of um, uh, Judge Burse in the High Court, uh, they're not as cool uh, as the Apple design. Um, that's re that was appealed by Apple, and recently on appeal, um, it's been confirmed uh, that yes, it isn't as cool as, as the Apple design. <laughs> um, but in, in the appeal judgment, it's easy just probably to read it to you, um, the judge here has gone out of his way to explain matters in the first few paragraphs. He says, um, because this case has generated much publicity, it would avoid confusion to say that this case, what this case is about and not about. It's not about whether Samsung copied Apple's iPad. Infringement of a registered design does not involve any question of whether there was copying. The issue is simply whether the accused design is too close to the registered design according to the tests laid down in the law. Whether or not Apple could have sued in England and Wales for copying is utterly irrelevant to the case. If they could, they did not. Likewise, there is no issue about infringement of any patent for an invention. And also, actually, in the US, um, where there was a finding of infringement, it wasn't for this design. Um, in the US, there was a, in the US, a registered design is called a design patent. And there was a design patent owned by Apple for this design. And the US jury found that not to be infringed. What they found to be infringed was a different um, patent. It was a, actually what we would call a patent in the US would be called a utility patent for part of the way that this software works. So design to protect the visual appearance of a product. That might be its shape, color, texture, uh, patterning, surface ornamentation. Um, to register a design, uh, design must be new one exception in the US and in the EU 
you can file your design application up to 12 months after you've put your design into the public domain, but beware that doesn't apply anywhere else. And so if you sell the product before you've made a first application, you've shot yourself in the foot for the rest of the world. Uh, it must differ sufficiently from existing designs. Copyright, um, back to our motor car, copyright will protect written materials that accompany it, the service manual. Uh, it will protect computer code uh, running on the engine management system and so on. Um, any other literary or any graphic work will be protected by copyright. Copyright arises automatically when you create an original work. It's not a registered right. Um, but looking overseas, some countries, uh, you can register it, but it's usually optional because the law still provides that it doesn't have to be registered. Sometimes it's useful to register to aid enforcement, but usually it's something which you can do when you need to. You don't have to do it in advance. So our third right was trademarks. Um, as I say, trademarks are slightly different to the other rights. The other rights are all protecting skill and labor in a product or an invention, a design, something that's been made. Uh, a trademark is providing protection uh, for you know, a trading style, for a badge of origin. Um, the most common trademarks to be registered are, are words. Um, this is a, just a summary of a community trademark registration. So this covers the whole of the EU. It protects the word mark Bentley. So it enables the owner to prevent third parties using Bentley and anything which is effectively confusingly similar in relation to the goods and services which are listed in the registration. Um, obviously, we've got motor vehicles. Um, we've also got other bits and pieces, um, jewelry, watches, uh, leather goods, and so on. Uh, and these are all goods which the company will use its uh, Bentley name on. Uh, for merchandising and, and so on. Uh, registering a, a word mark, and they're usually shown in plain block capitals, provides protection for the mark no matter how it's used. So that's usually the, the best way to get the broadest protection. Other trademarks, logos of course, um, so that protects that logo and anything which looks uh, sufficiently similar. Sometimes you need to do a, <coughs> a combination of the two to get the best protection. Um, an example of a mark that we look after is the, the GOLA trademark, G-O-L-A, um, that's registered as a word. It's also registered in a stylized way in that it's used. Um, because, say for example, uh, someone uses the mark BOLA. Comparing the two words, they're not that similar. People aren't going to confuse them. But if a third party used BOLA in the same stylized way that we use GOLA, then people could be confused. So to get the best protection, you register it both ways. Words and logos are by far the most common, um, but there are some slightly more exotic uh, trademarks. Uh, here is one. This is fairly unusual because it protects the shape. It's the shape of this article that is considered to be the trademark. Um, and this is an air vent. This is another uh, Bentley case. Um, their view is that they have a particular type of bullseye air vent on the dashboard, uh, which if you're sitting in the car and you didn't see any other badges, you saw that vent, you would think you were in a Bentley. Uh, so that acts as their trademark. And that's a fairly, fairly rare item. Other rare marks are colors. It's possible to register a color as a trademark. Examples will be BP with green, um, Cadbury's with their particular shade of purple, uh, for chocolate. Um, sounds, uh, for example, the, the direct line jingle. Um, smells, you really struggle, I think, to think of an example. There is a registration, which is for a Japanese company, which has protected the smell of roses for tires. Um, but it's a real uphill struggle to get a registration for one of these more exotic marks. You usually have to show that it's functioning as your uh, trademark. Uh, in order to get a registration. 
contrary to all the other rights, particularly in the patents and designs, where you've got to get your application in whilst the uh, invention or design is new, you can apply to register a trademark at any time, but um, in most countries, the registration systems are first to file, and it's the first to file that gets the rights. Um, so, you know, looking to China in particular, it's important to get your application on file before someone else does, because uh, it's very difficult to uh, get it back if it's been filed by a third party.